Um, hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us this evening for our first uh, session of our Bay Area Fellowship, um, just info session over Zoom. Uh, like Christina mentioned, we will be recording um, this presentation if you need to go back and watch it or share it with friends or if you're just looking for something to enjoy on a Friday evening. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, feel free to rewatch it. We'll be uploading it to our YouTube when it's ready. Um, but to start off, uh, my name is Ziliana Tejada. I am the Senior Manager of Fellowship Programs here at Headland Center for the Arts. And I will let Christina introduce herself. Yeah, um, I'm Christina. Um, I am the Programs Coordinator here and been here about a year, but on and off since 2017. So glad to be a yeah. part of the community. So um, as far as the Bay Area Fellowship goes, um, we, Christina and I work in collaboration on um, ultimately making uh, our artists and cohort dreams come true as much as we can. Um, uh, I think as far as this fellowship, fellowship goes, um, you'll be hearing from either me or her um, throughout the course of the fellowship um, if you end up participating. So um you'll get to know us more closely so uh with that um let's get started uh just with the agenda um we're gonna start with the program overview um we'll, we'll really unpack um exactly what this program um is about and what to expect if you end up participating in it um, and then after that, uh, we'll dive into the application process and kind of um, how that unfolds and what to expect as far as like um, things that we're looking for um, and, you know, criteria, eligibility, et cetera. Um, and then after that, just hoping to spend some time going over program experience and really dishing out some information on more of the culture here at Headlands, um, which includes, uh, you know, events that you're all probably familiar with. Um, I think our most popular being Open House, um, which you may or may not have attended. Um, and then after that, just going into Q&A, where we'll really be able to just open the floor and have you all ask questions. Um, but in addition to that, wanted to point out that there is a Q&A button. If anything does come up throughout the presentation and you just like want to like say it um, before you forget, feel free to type it into the Q&A. Um, I think Christina is going to be able to see it um, because I can since I'm in the presentation mode. But um, we can either decide if it feels appropriate to stop during the presentation and just like acknowledge the question or we'll save it towards the end and just answer it during Q&A. Mm -hmm. So, um, great. So program overview, um, again, we'll go over the program introduction, program goals and object objectives, award and support, and then just summary of expectations. So <clears throat> program introduction. Um, the Bay Area Fellowship engages artists as a collaborator in designing and producing their own fellowship, um, bringing, into, bringing them into the Headlands community um, as thought partners. So um, I guess for me, like when explaining this to artists that I run into on a daily basis and they ask questions about the Bay Area Fellowship, um, in relation to programs that we've offered in the past, um, again, all right, feel like our biggest one being the artist in residence program and our grad fellow program um, at this point we used to have the affiliate program with, which was sunsetted a couple years ago um, but those ones are more like specifically like we've invite artists to participate in the headlands community um, and they kind of take what's being offered which is typically a studio space and programming that's already been developed and um, kind of already has a sequence to it, um, which again includes like that open house, um, members dinners, um, et cetera. Um, for the Bay Area Fellowship, it's kind of um, more flexible in a way where we're looking at artists as collaborators um, and they really 
come in working not just with me and Christina, but with like everyone else that we have on staff to design um, a vision, a scope, and like really programming that engages the community in like a different way. Um, one way that I really like to explain this also, I'm, like if you know me, I love sports. So it's really the difference between like Nike representing an athlete and just dishing them gear mm -hmm. versus like Nike bringing in an athlete to like collaborate on an entire product, right? So um, we're, this program is kind of like the second um, e uh, example of that, where you're really going to be coming in with us um, with the hopes of like designing and creating an experience um, for the community in the Bay or beyond. Um, so I hope that helps um, with it making a little bit more sense. Um, program goals and objectives. Um, the fellowship, uh, one of the main goals is to support and engage Bay Area artists at key moments in their careers. Um, and, and I actually just asked Christina exactly like what we define this being. Um, and it, it, it is, again, just like the program description, it's, a, it's really flexible um, in meeting individuals at like, um, you know, whether you're you're trying to change your practice in a way that, uh, you know, you're going from a studio practice to uh, doing more community engaged work, um, whether you're working in sculpture and want to get into painting, whether you're a painter and like you're working in a studio practice, but like you want to expand that in a way that um, again, engages the community more. Like there, it, it really is like endless opportunity and it's, um, it's something that we're hoping this program really like helps push you towards um, towards or gives you the momentum to like achieve those goals. Um, in addition to that, it's building meaningful connections between the Bay Area arts community, um, Headlands visiting artists and fellows. Um, the Headlands has a huge, um, you know, we're, we're global. Our artists in residence program artists come from all around the world and um, you know, in addition to that, we have grad fellows that are on campus throughout the year. We have the Turner Saul um, recipient that's also on campus. So um, there's different ways that this um, that this can happen. And Christina will touch base on them when, once we get into talking about like um, the Headlands community as a whole. But that's also something um, that this program is just hoping to touch touch on. Um, challenge and rethink traditional power dynamics between arts, nonprofits, and artists by engaging with artists as full partners and collaborators. Again, um, this is something that's really exciting for us and just like this program, um, especially like really transforming the way that we um, collaborate with artists. Um, and again, not just like dishing out resources um, without any, like uh, with not a lot of creative backing to it. Um, and then just connect fellows to each other through cohort building processes. Um, you know, that, that is, that is always something that's on our mind, regardless of the program. Um, and this one specifically, cause it's more, um, Bay area fellow artists, I think, um, like really using these fellows as a resource, um, especially depending on where their career is um, and making those connections with artists and residents that come through the space and uh, our grad fellows um, and just really building that relationship and, you know, see, seeing it, seeing where it goes. So um, awards and support. Um, so the annual fellow um, when selected will get a $20,000 stipend. Um, and the tax burden on that stipend as well as health coverage will get reimbursed. Um, and for, you know, ultimately that just means um, for the $20,000 $20, stipend, you will get that full amount and anything that's taxed by it um, will be covered by us. And for health coverage, um, it's kind of the same thing. If you don't have health coverage, you'll work with us on like, you know, helping find a resource for that. Or if you already have health coverage, um, we'll reimburse you for what you currently pay. Um, 
And additional available resources. Um, I think, Christina, you wanted to touch base on that a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. I kind of wanted, um, if you're cool with it, Illy, can I talk, can I go back to the, to the slide before and mm -hmm. just talk a little bit about like where this fellowship has been and, and like mm -hmm. where, where, why it was kind of formed and some of the factors that, um, influenced it. Um, I, I love, I love the comparison that you made to Nike that even though I don't, I'm not a sports person that hit home, um, and that feels legit. Um, so I just wanted to say that, like, for those of you who know this, uh, or for those of you who are just hearing about this, this is a three-year-old, this is, um, it's actually a two-year-old program going into its third year. So it's very, very new. Um, and there are a couple of things that influenced its, um, uh, it, it, its foundation and its birth. Um, like Ileana mentioned, we uh, used to have a, a really robust affiliate program, which um, directly uh, provided resources to Bay Area artists specifically, whereas all of our other programs are like uh, national, international, et cetera. Um, and the affiliate program was able to provide studio space um, and some other resources. But once we lost one of our, a, a good portion of our studios, which went back to the park, we were like, well, crap, we don't have space to offer. So like, what could offering resources to Bay Area artists now evolve into? Um, so that was one big thing that influenced the creation of this program a few years ago. And then the second thing is that, um, you know, we have really been thinking about how we've been a very internal organization and a lot of the magic that happens, happens in this internal way. And occasionally we invite the public in and they get to have dinners with us and we'll have open houses. But um, we've been thinking about alongside the park, um, how do we have a bigger public presence and how are we um, cultivating or sorry, how are we sharing the um, work that is being created and being resourced and supported at the headlands with the broader Bay Area community? So it felt really important to like, um, you know, give some of that magic back to the, to the public. So this program does have a really significant kind of public facing intention. Um, and the ways that that manifests are in a variety of, of different programs that Ileana is going to talk about. Um, but it's this, it's really this balance of like deep artist support um, and resourcing in a way that is like pretty um, flexible and giving and like does not require that artists, like Ileana said, like stick to the art that they came into the program with, but allows them safe space to experiment. But also pairing that with um, really thoughtful and uh, creative public engagement. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add a little history to the program. Um, yeah. Cool, Thanks but then yeah, and so I, yeah. Yeah, and I will say also, um, I think a thing that I missed to say is like in addition to that, it's like also just one of our main goals and objectives is finding ways like a lot of people to find, um, to keep artists in the Bay mm. um, yeah. and really trying to create a platform that allows for that to happen yeah so for sure so important that's like number one um okay so the thing about the additional available resources these are things that ha like how do I put it like these are all negotiable to some extent like we uh like Ileana said because this is like something that we're trying to develop in partnership with artists um instead of saying like this is exactly what you get we say, this is what's possible. Now, how can we negotiate like based off of the resources that we have and the needs that you have? How can we map out your year to understand how you might take advantage of these resources? So you might not be guaranteed studio space necessarily. And yet, if you come to us and you're like, yo, I'm in this like three month period where I don't have any studio space and I have a show coming up, like what can we do? We are, you know, there's a lot of possibility there that we might be able to allocate studio space. Um, we've had, um, we've had our Bay Area fellows in the past, literally reserve the housing for a weekend for the collaborators and then use um, some of our larger project spaces to do rehearsals. This was a, a performance based artist. Um, Ileana and I, one of, I think, honestly, one of the biggest resources that y'all uh, can tap from us, and that a lot of artists have used is project management skills. And this is something that like, is pretty rare and weird and artists are always like, wait, what? But like we, we like can partner with you if needed to project manage programs, to project manage publications. Um, so like really tapping us as coordination support, 
um, as people who, who who live and breathe project management. It's um so this additional available resources thing. It's like it's nebulous. There's a lot of possibility, and all and always it's going to be a negotiation between what the um what the institution has to offer and what the needs are. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll also probably dive more into this when we talk about um, like the community, community here, but staff time and expertise. One thing that I want to mention is a lot of the staff that are um, are on the roster here are all artists um, and we all mm. work in different disciplines. Um, we're visual artists, we're musicians, we're filmmakers. Um, we have, you know, preparators uh, that work on the facilities team. Um, fabricators, et cetera. So mm -hmm. uh, depending on uh, what project you all wanna unpack, um, we we try to bring them in in collaboration with whatever it is mm. that we're doing. So um, it, it really is like endless opportunity. So um, summary and expectations. Um, so like Christina mentioned, um, the, the program as it existed before was a two year, fellowship. Um, we're now turning that, it's now turning into a three-year fellowship, um, and it's awarded for the duration of one year to begin with renewal for an additional two years by mutual agreement. Um, and we'll have check-ins throughout the year um, just to see how things are going and, um, you know, things are working out. And uh, for the most part, like that's most, that is pretty much guaranteed, um, unless something really dramatic happens. But uh, everyone that we've worked with so far has been really excited to collaborate with us and um, it's it's been really uh, wonderful in that way. So um, the fellowships will occur in phases with initial, initial visioning and design, uh, midpoint check-ins and annual review. Um, the one thing I will say about this is every artist that we've worked with um, really does work differently um, as far as the um, like check-in process goes, for example. Um, some artists really are looking to meet on a like monthly basis, whereas others are a little bit more hands off with what they're doing and really just want check ins every quarter and whatnot. So it for this specific um, point, it just really depends on who we're working with um, and what the need is. Um, sometimes, you know, depending or sometimes that really does start happening. Um, like if we're working on a project together or a program together. Um, that really like increases um, as far as like the connection that we're having or the communication that we're having. And then sometimes people just need to do what they need to do and like will dip for two months because um, they're on an island somewhere um, doing research on backpipes. So it really depends who you are and what you're up to. So uh, the BFA program is a research-based award, but not a residency program. Um, so just again, what that means is um, you're not necessarily guaranteed a studio space here. Um, but if the time does come that like you're looking for a space because you're having a studio visit with the curator from some gallery or um, you're just really looking to document your work or, um, you know, whatever the case may be, um, we will work with Holly, who runs our artists in residence program um, to try to, you know, allocate some space or find some somewhere that's available for you to um, make that happen. Um, and then applicants should be residents of the Bay Area um, with access to their own housing and studio space. Um, but again, I mean, as we speak, we have uh, an artist that we're working with, Viet, who has been, has had a lot of programming who, you know, needed housing this month. So um, it, it can become available. Um, it just needs to be a conversation that happens. Um, and again, working with Holly to see if if we can make it happen. So, and here's a picture. That was the picture of us at the retreat that we did at um, Salmon Creek in Mendocino. I'm wearing the same hat. I'm like, I don't always you, wear this hat. <laughs> you really are. You really are. I'm wearing a different outfit. <laughs> Um, let me see here. So summary and expectations. Um, during their time, fellows are expecting to collaborate on developing two to three public engagements um, with Headland staff, uh, which is usually me and Christina, um, either at Headlands in their home communities or around the Bay Area. Um, 
Well, we're, we have some examples of some projects that um, some of our Bay Area fellows have done, um, but you can, and hopefully you can really see the different spaces that we've tapped into um, in the Bay and this coming year, hopefully beyond. Um, and, you know, they, they can, they can be anywhere from like a one-on-one -on -one conversation to something like huge. Um, I think one thing that we go into when we're trying to um, uh, engage with the artists that we work with is um, one thing that we tell them is just like, think of like the dream thing that you want to do and like just jot down everything that would it, it would take to make it happen. And then we'll, you'll come to us and then looking at what we have available, we'll really try to break that down to see what's actually possible. Um, and we definitely try our very best to like meet all the needs that you're, all the big needs that you're looking for. So um, with that, you know, ideal candidates will have an interest in participating in headless artist community throughout, um, you know, throughout the year, which includes open houses. Um, and internal programs um, for those that ha have been to the campus and have been lucky enough to come to one of our dinners um, that's prepared by our, uh, let's say longtime chef, he's been here a hot second, um, Chef Damon. Um, those are those are an amazing way to content connect with our artists and residents and our grad fellows. Um, in addition to the other, you know, like the Turnasol awardee um, and, uh, you you're if you participate in it like it's um they're very wholesome and the food is amazing um and then studio visits and then we will have um retreats planned uh planned once a year anything to add to that christina um i just wanted to note that there there was a question that came into the q a um about if students are eligible i think let's uh we'll add that on to the end for um the question section but it's a great question um I think the only, yeah, the only thing that I want to say here that I think you've made pretty clear is that because we are literally planning to spend three years with these, with, with this, with these fellows, um, and working really closely to design the program, we're really looking for people who have a real vested interest in being a part of Headlands as, as if, as if like a family member. Um, mm -hmm. So we, everybody who we've had go through this fellowship program so far, we leave feeling like we're great friends, we're family. We've we've been in the trenches with them. We produce programs. We produce art. Um, so it's it's really a it's a really a, it's a I don't want to say a deep relationship. It sounds really intense, but it is a relationship. And we're looking for folks who are interested in collaborating with an institution on that level, recognizing that an institution is just made up of a bunch of individuals like me and Eliana, who are also humans and also artists. So, um, yeah, I will say that it's a deep deep relationship I think for many I, I'm not lying I think for um the roster that we've had to work with and the conversations that we have had with them it's been pretty emotional and pretty life-changing for a lot of them so um I mean I I feel like that's fair to say that it's pretty deep and um you know that that's a true statement yeah there's been yeah. there's been a lot there I mean not a lot of tears but yeah. it's been pretty emotional and um yeah. powerful in that way Powerful for sure mm -hmm. yeah okay so this is a perfect example of what Eliana was talking about where uh you know we tell artists just like what's your big thing what's your big dream and then let's figure out how to make it happen within you know obviously within the like limitations of the actuality of the resources and capacity that we have but this artist Torea um who some of you I'm sure might be aware of um when we were going through, when we were having conversations about what their kind of culminating project was going to be, they were like, well, okay, th it, this is crazy, but there is this one thing that I've wanted to do for a really long time and been not sure how to manifest. And they were like, I want to create a film on a historic, uh, um, on a historic ship, one of the ones in the Maritime Museum that references a kind of uh, history of uh, like queer and uh, like queer folks and folks who were um, uh, oppressed and criminalized for cross-dressing as in 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 the historic words in the 1800s as a part of the Barbary uh, Coast. And we were like, okay, uh, a ship you say, very interesting. Um, and we got on it. We worked through our 
Park Service contacts, and it was surprisingly easy to secure this ship for them for the period of time that we needed it. Um, and they were able to produce a program that was very unique because it was just straight up the creation of a film as a program as a with a live audience. And we told people, we were like, you know what? You're here to witness art making in process, not to necessarily be entertained. All that's to say they were still on a boat watching folks in drag, in maritime drag, uh, keel haul a big weight, so it was entertaining. But um, this is the type of flexibility of programs that we're interested in, where we are, uh, we're thinking big about, about, the, about what the actual action is. We're thinking big about where it can take place. And we're also thinking about breaking down the kind of traditional barriers of like audience and performer and what the expectations are uh, from the audience and from the performers. So a lot, um, a lot of big dreaming in this situation that in, in a lot of big ways we were able to make it happen. So um, we can't say we can do everything, but we can do a fair amount. <laughs> um, this was another program that I worked on with um, Erica Chongshuk, who uh, just finished her fellowship. Her fellowship was really um, unique and wonderful because she was technically the only fellow that was a part of the Headlands. However, she came with her crew. She came with her production company called For You Productions, who basically then became, it, it kind of became that the whole collective itself uh, was a part of the fellowship in a lot of ways. Um, and we produced a number of programs over the last year with them. Um, this one was a seven, this is actually a seven series interactive performance um, that was an, um, an expansion of work that she had uh, done in the past that was about um, artists pairing, paired with elders to um, understand their stories and then make work around their stories. Um, and we partnered with the Jones Institute for this one. It's a really awesome art space in the city um, out of um, the owner's house. So again, really creatively thinking about space. It wasn't something that we felt like we could handle at the Headlands, that we had space restrictions at the Headlands at the time, but it was still like, well, let's figure out how to still make this happen in a different way and adjust the program and adjust the expectations of the program in order to, um, yeah, in order to adapt it to the to the space limitations that we had at the time. So uh, weird, magical stuff. Um, yeah, next one's all you, Ellie. And then, um, yeah, Arlene Correa Valencia, who um, many of you may be familiar with the work that she does. And I think this is a perfect example of somebody that we worked with where the, the work itself was very emotional. Um, this event that we did with Arlene, uh, there was a lot of tears. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with Arlene's work, it 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 covers a lot of conversation regarding, regarding being undocumented. Um, and Arlene is a visual artist, so a lot of the work that she's done up to this has um, work that you can you can see in a gallery on a wall, um, you know. And this, I think, was when this conversation started. It was ultimately me, um, me and Christina getting to learn about Arlene's story um, and the story of how her and her partner Nelson ended up getting. Um, married and how that decision was made out of fear um, in response to the newly elected government during that time. Um, and for them not being able to properly um, celebrate this with love, um, also, like, you know, they, they made a decision um, and within a week it happened. So it was a reclaiming ceremony for them. Um, and this took place at the Headlands. So this and this was probably one of the biggest productions that we've done because um, it involved a lot of collaborators. Um, you know, we had a mariachi band uh, that came through. We had a group of um, cousins that had a taco truck. Um, her cousin. It was very um, a lot of support from her family uh, participated <laughs> because her cousin Brenda came through um, and prepared cocktails for the evening. So it was it was just like a, such a magical, wonderful evening. Um, and it was uh, a, a part of it was really awesome or the awesome part of it was that um, it was a private moment um, that you typically celebrate with family, but we opened it, we opened tickets up to the public with not so much information mentioning that it was ultimately gonna be a wedding. 
Um, so individuals that purchased ticket, tickets from the public ended up showing up, not exactly knowing what to expect. Um, so it was kind of a really, um, it was powerful in that way because she was inviting them into a space um, that was very intimate and uh, they shared stories about their experience growing up um, and again, just the fear behind it. And um, it is just wonderful to for her to be able to take all that back um, using the resources that we have. And she, she her and Nelson, um, who's her partner ended up leaving uh, very, just very happy. I think we're still, at least I look back at this and like, I'm still like, still get excited that, that it was able to happen. So, um, yeah. Uh, now we'll dive into the application. Um, application fellowship period, eligibility and selection criteria. Um, so the application is um, now open for those of you that um, are curious, it opened up December 1st. So if you head over to our website and look up the Bay Area Fellowship, you should be able to find a link that takes you to the slide room application. Um, those are due February 15th with um, and then April 24th um, is when we'll start scheduling finalist interviews. Um, May 24th, applic applicants notified of acceptance and then looking for a July 2024 um, start to the, the this cohort. And then you'll just see the breakdown of the fellowship um, years after that. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so the Bay Area Fellowship application process. Um, so we are uh, currently um, soliciting applications through an open call process. Um, uh, those applications will be evaluated by outside evaluators. Um, and we're still in the process of identifying who those individuals are going to be. Um, and then a limited number of those applicants will advance to a finalist round. So for that first portion of it, um, it's really gonna be in the hands of those individuals um, or those evaluators. Um, and they'll really just going to be coming back to us with their recommendations. Um, and then we'll kind of take it over from there um, and move forward with the finalists that they select. Um, and then for those finalists, uh, we're gonna be offering a thousand dollar stipends um, for you all to present and discuss your work um, in an interview or studio visit format. Um, and then evaluators will select two Bay Area fellows from that pool of finalists to begin um, fellowships in the summer of 2024. Um, so eligibility, um, Bay Area fellows must be able to prove current or um, continuous residence in the Bay Area no later than February 15, 2023. Um, and you'll see the Bay Area region or the nine counties there. Um, Bay Area fellows can work in any artistic discipline. Um, so again, we're really excited um, just like our staff to work like if you're a musician if you're a writer if you're a poet if uh, you know dancer visual artist whatever the case may be um, it we're really trying to find a diverse pool of individuals in both disciplines and just like overall um, just like diversity so like honestly like endless opportunity there um, and just we have to note, uh, Headlands is located in a national park without significant public transportation. Um, and for all our programs, uh, successful artists um, or individuals that participate with us have to have a reliable ve vehicle, otherwise um, secure their own transportation because it is really difficult just to make it out here um, if that's not the case. And, uh, unfortunately, our public transit got uh, discontinued during the pandemic and hasn't made its way back yet. So, um, and then so selection criteria, um, strength of artistic work, uh, pushing the boundaries of discipline. Um, again, at a pivotal, pivotal moment in their practice, um, 
and just the capacity and desire to envision and collaborate with headlands. Um, I feel like we we covered most of this early on, but um, in the presentation, but yeah, just really looking at um, individuals that are ambitious and um, really trying to get themselves into the next phase of their career. Um, so what do current Bay Area fellows have to say? Um, these quotes were oh. pulled from, did I not? Did I no, myself? no, you were great. You were great. Um, I just have a couple questions that are coming in. I think are um, directly related to that last slide. Um, I do want to acknowledge that I have two more questions that were related to the um, programs uh, slide. And so let's address those at the end, but since this is related to those last two. So we have, um, Illy, could you clarify what you mean by a pivotal moment in your practice? Yeah, so we kind of um, touched base on that a little bit earlier when I think we phrased it a little bit differently. Um, like a, I think we said a pivotal moment in their career. Um, and yeah, I, I just really said, like focusing on or saying that artists that are transforming, like this, can, like ex, uh, ex, getting this award is really um, like can transform the direction that their practice is going in. Like whether you're a painter, a drawer, and you're looking to do more social practice work, um, you know something more like that. I don't know if there's a different way you can explain it, Christina, because this is, I know we had this conversation like five minutes before we jumped on this, trying to define this. Yeah, I think that this can, this is like kind of intentionally broad. And what Illy is talking about is like, um, a, actually a pivotal moment in their practice where like, like, like she said, um, this award would allow them the space, flexibility, freedom, confidence to be able to explore a new direction that doesn't have to necessarily mean a change in your uh, discipline but uh but that it grows you in a direction that you feel that you've been clearly wanting to explore but that you haven't had the opportunity or resources to do so I think also we can be a if we replace a pivotal moment in their practice with a pivotal moment in their career <laughs> where you're on the precipice of kind of um like really gaining traction um with your career goals and that um the resources and support that you would receive within this fellowship would really push you over the edge. And during the application, you'll really have the opportunity to um, write about and reflect on what that means to you and how you believe this this uh, fellowship program uh, uh, meets you at a significant moment, either in your practice, in your career, and will offer, a, um, <coughs> offer you a, a significant um, kind of boost. So... Yeah. I think okay. another way to say it too, um, and just to give examples, is the current Bay Area fellows that we have, like the resources or the way that they've used the money that they've received is some of them have been wanting to do research in like different places, literally across the globe, and have used the money that they get from this fellowship to go off and do that research. So it funds um, like travel and stay and like they pay for classes. Um, and I think Arlene is another example. Um, Arlene was the one that we just talked about that had the reclaiming ceremony. Um, one thing that we were able to do for her is um, she was recently able for the first time to be able to travel overseas and uh, use the resources that we gave her to be able to do that. Um, and that was a long time coming. Um, you know, other artists have used it, like Christina said, to learn a new skill. Um, that they've been wanting to learn. Um, and it's really sh shifted the way that they're thinking about their work. So it is it is really flexible um, and yeah, very broad. So it just, it really depends what it is at the moment that you want to try to achieve and then finding ways that we can support that. Yeah. So I hope, I hope that makes more sense. Yeah. I think we're really gonna be looking for y'all to tell us how this would significantly impact your practice or your career. Um, and then I wanna say there was another one related to pivotal moment that I just wanted to speak more about. Oh yeah, um, so someone says, can a pivotal moment be if you're an elder? And I just wanna say that I don't think that that has, I don't think that a pivotal moment has anything to do with age necessarily. Um, I think it's just about where you are within your practice and where you are within your career. Um, and then the last thing that is related to this is um, about, let's see. Um, oh, right, mid-career. And, and emerging artists, how do you define emerging and mid-career artists? And would you encourage emerging artists to apply? 
And this will be the last uh, one until we go to q and I just felt like it was favorite. related. <laughs> my favorite, emerging artists versus mid-career versus established. Um, I've spent right. my entire life trying to define what puts one above the other. And I think that's also like, I don't know. I I find a lot of humor in, uh, behind those those terms. But um, I think this program, uh, from what I've heard, was originally established as being open to mid-career and esta uh, established artists. Um, but as it progresses, um, loosening up that kind of like barrier or um, restriction and having it be open to everyone. Um, and I think for us, what we're really, really looking for is individuals that kind of or not kind of, but like know the trajectory that they wanna go in with their practice and can really um, like define that and like uh, present that and um, for us to be able to work in collaboration and making that happen. So um, I know the current application um, mentions that emphasis will be given to mid-career and established artists. And I think, you know, if we had to define that, um, for me, it's not necessarily ga uh, gallery representation, but like you do have like at least a solo show like under the books or, you know, some kind of um, um, like one or two uh, gallery shows, um, you know, some kind of following that it really shows that you're dedicated to like making um, this like a uh, or making your practice like a very big part of your life um but yeah i i i think at this point like we i at least i would be excited to see all kinds of levels of artist apply um yeah. and for us to really just be able to see who can see a vision for where they want to go and mm -hmm. how we're going to be a part of that I love that, Illy. Yeah, I think that a vision for where they want to go, how we're going to be a part of it, and also how they have worked towards and contributed to that vision thus far. Yeah, and then, you know, just really showing that you're dedicated to being part of the Bay Area arts community. Um, you know, I think most people that are in this presentation know that how small and intimate it is um, and how I, I, my favorite thing about it is like everyone knows everyone um and you know coming into the fellowship wanting to be a part of that and be part of it in a positive way I think is really important for us as well mm -hmm. yeah so all right cool so there's a lot more but we'll save it we'll save the rest for the end I just wanted to stop us I at love that moment. This. <laughs> I knew it I just I knew it um so what current Bay Area fellows have to say um so these quotes were just pulled from conversations in the uh, in evaluations that we had with our current Bay Area fellow cohort. Um, so hopefully they give some insight as to what they have experienced. Um, so this individual, I think it's very evident how non-generic it is because other fellowships and other residencies feel like they're very generic. Um, like everything is provided on the same level for every artist in this one. So far from what I get, um, it fluctuates from individual to individual. Um, so I think this is, I, I love that word non-generic because um, I think for a lot of us, the fellowships and residencies that we have applied for, it really is like you show up, they give you what they have available and like you just learn to work with it. Whereas this one is like, you really come in and work in collaboration with us that does fluctuate from individual to individual um, based on their needs. And with that, like some are some, again, need a more intimate um, relationship, whereas others are more, uh, you know, on their own and are able to just like find their way and like tap into us every so often when they just need an additional help or an additional push. Um, this one is kind of a pat on the back for us, but I felt like it was also really important to point out. Um, these people really want to help me, and that's what really made the difference. Um, this is the headlines. Again, we are a group of individuals that I kid you not, we really want to help you. Uh, yesterday was just the perfect example. <laughs> also, um, you know, there was an artist on campus that just like needed assistance on getting something over to Oakland, and there was probably like six of us on the thread trying to figure out a way to make that happen. And there's so many examples of that. 
Um, and we really do want you to succeed. Uh, you know, again, we are artists ourselves. And um, I think we see a lot of like what we ambition us mm. as being like wanting. Um, and we try to dish that out to y'all. And uh, it really is a huge support group in that way. I think so. it was, um, since I see already how many questions we have to answer and we only have 12 minutes left. Um, oh, let's go. Let's speed through these quotes and they can read them for themselves later. So I think my practice has definitely been supportive beyond the physical. Um, you know, the fellowship stipend has been tremendous, but I think that the kind of expansive time, the gift of time and community and the resources um, is what really makes us stand out. Um, so program experience, Christina, you can like fly through this. All right, I'll go quick. I feel like um, if you want to go to the next slide, Headland staff and community. I feel like I've said a lot about the the kind of um, humanness of the relationship between the artists and the staff. Like Ileana said, we're all creatives. Um, we're all pretty nerdy in a lot of different ways. Um, everybody's got their own kind of thing. Um, and it's just an incredibly like process-based and supportive staff. So we all are a constant kind of thinking in process and thinking about how, um, you know, like not necessarily about um, finished product or about like the way things should be or have to be, but instead are thinking really dynamically about how the way things are and how they can be. Um, so yeah, just a very, very responsive, very reflexive, warm staff. And we have a lot of cute dogs, which is super important. Um, oh, tons of cute, literally, <laughs> I cannot show. Yeah. Ileana is at Madi, our executive director's house right now, watching her dog. So yeah, it's very close knit. Um, go, go to the next one. Um, y'all know where we are. For those of you who haven't been out here, um, hit up me and Ileana and come up for a visit. We're open five days a week. Um, so please do check it out. Um, the vibes are majestic and moody sometimes because of the fog and there it's old and there's layers of history and there's this like a weird experience where we're doing incredibly modern and contemporary work alongside buildings that have all of this, all of these layers of, um, you know, ghosts and stories and um, the, the building has been used and turned over in so many different ways throughout the years. So it's a really interesting layered environment. Um, yay. Okay, cool. Let's just, uh, if you guys have more questions about the culture, we can, we can talk more. Um, I have two questions that I feel really excited to answer and then we're just going to rattle them off, Philly. So the one I'm super excited to answer is, are any current fellows also parents? And do you see being a parent artist as compatible with this particular fellowship? Um, and alongside that, can people work while being in this program? And like, yes, emphatic yes to both of those things. Um, almost half of our fellows last year, I think, were parents. And um, a part of the ways that we're committed to supporting artists is by thinking of them as holistic humans. And your families are also a part of that. So when we went on our retreat last year, two of the parents, two of the artists brought their kids, which was amazing. We secured housing for the kids. We looked into securing childcare. Um, so this is a part of the ways that we're really serious about being flexible and meeting you where you are. Um, and working for sure. Like there's no, the only real like time expectations and commitments that we have from y'all are like meet with us for like either once a month or every few months, um, join cohort program, like join cohort meetups, um, produce programs with us one to two a year. Um, but otherwise we don't expect that you're like taking time out of your day job to be on site. Again, this is like really supporting the current artistic practice that you have and growing it in the ways that you want to grow it. And we work with you to do that. So those two, I was excited to answer. Um, here, Illy, um, let's see, when does the finalist round of interview studio visits happen? And when are you notified if you have or have not been selected to move forward to that round? Uh, we better go back to, I gotta see what that timeline is. Um, so we'll go back to, so in April, by April, 2024, finalist um, interview starts. So um, <clears throat> right before that, um, you'll, individuals that don't make it to that round will be notified and that'll be via email um, by either me or Christina. Um, 
And then May 2024, applicants notified of acceptance um, with the hope of July 2024 um, cohort beginning. And that July 2024, um, that's kind of like where a lot of our shift, or not a lot of our shift, but our Turner Saw awardee um, will have the new one coming in for our 2025th. Um, year and then our new graduate fellows will be starting um, at the beginning of August. So that July 2024, um, you'll be coming in with like a fresh group of individuals um, and you'll be onboarding at the same time as they do. Um, and I guess another thing to mention is for the first year, um, you'll be overlapping with our current cohort of Bay Area fellows that will be ending their relationship with us in September. Um, but then by next July, um, we'll have the second or no third, fourth round of the Bay Area Fellowship iteration starting. So that'll be another two fellows that come in that you'll start overlapping with. And then the year after that, another two. And it's kind of like this. Um, that's kind of how like they, they're all staggered together. If that, like, that makes sense visually. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a couple of people asking how many per cohort. Um, we accept two per year, which means that starting this year, there'll be two uh, in addition to the three who are, or sorry, in addition to the four who are left over from last year. Uh, next year, when we ha when we get two more, that'll be four total. And then year three, there'll be six total. So two accepted per year with a total cohort size of six at any given moment after year three. Um, Sorry if that was. It's like the hardest thing to explain. I know. Um, how many applicants usually apply? Um, I think for this program, we'll probably get, uh, I'd say, three to four hundred. Um, the Air program gets over eleven hundred, but that's a national and international program. So this one, I would say, yeah, in the, in the hundreds. Um. If you don't drive or have a car, that has been a barrier for me in the past, but now that there's Lyft and Uber and the bus on the weekends, would that be okay? I feel like this is a big barrier. And I've been a finalist in the past and was told because I don't have a car, I couldn't do the residency and was also offered residency, but had a day job, so couldn't do it. Okay. Um, so I think the question is about transportation um, and cars being an issue. The job thing is not an issue for us at all for this particular fellowship. Um, Illy, do you want to answer the transportation question? Um, I actually don't think that public transit comes out this way. Uh, at least from our end, we haven't heard that it's been um, restarted. But and we know that Uber and Lyft occasionally come out here. I've never been able to successfully been able like able to book something. Um, but it, it it is unfortunately a huge barrier and it is something that we need to acknowledge in addition to just bridge tolls unless you're coming from um, Marin or the North Bay. Um, a lot of the artists coming from SF and Oakland will have to tag on like that additional bridge toll. Um, I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but it is really, it's just unfortunately really unlikely Um but with that, like we did have an artist that we worked with pre uh, in the previous cohort that didn't have transportation and they did make it work. Um, but it it was it was really hard. Um, yeah, I can't currently think of ways to help, like unless we help like purchase a car with the the money that we give you. Um, can't really think of a a way to be able to make that happen at the moment. But Lyft and Uber. You know, you can definitely get in here, but I know it's been challenging to get out of here. Um, and then hopefully soon the park service starts up that that bus again, because before I had a car, that was the way that I got out here. Well, I know uh, that's not really Yeah, I think that that's just another one of those things that like is not necessarily a deal breaker if you don't have transportation out here. Um, but it's just another one of those things that we we would have to kind of like negotiate resources around. Um, so let's see. Oh yeah, there was a good one earlier about um, the programs we were talking about. So we were talking about all of those like big, exciting programs. 
Um, and we got a question that said, are the cost of materials and resources for such projects coming out of the fellowship award? No. So not necessarily. Um, when, when we're talking public programs, each public engagement has its own budget. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, it, I don't want to say a number necessarily, but it's pretty, uh, supportive. And then um, as we work together throughout the year to talk about work you want to make that is not related to a public engagement, we have resources to help support um, artwork production and materials and things like that. So I would say that um, if there, if there will be able to offer you like a, a kind of set amount of resources to contribute towards artwork production and public programs, and if it goes over that, then it may end up coming out of the fellowship award, but um, we have a significant amount of funds set aside to produce work. Um, are there plans to expand the number of Bay Area fellows after this year? Um, this is all dependent on funding for us. So as of now, we're to a year um, and we would love to expand. We are just, uh, yeah, we would love to, and it's all just a conversation around funding and with funders. Um, Illy, I'm going to have you answer this one. Do exhibitions organized on our own throughout our time in university count or are established gallery specific shows encouraged more? I think they count. Yeah, I feel like those are absolutely, uh, yeah, those are exhibitions. Uh, whether they take place for me, honestly, whether they take place in an apartment, a pop-up space, a gallery space, a museum, like whatever the case, I, I feel like they, we will absolutely see them and consider them as exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we're like super strict about like how work is being presented. I think it's more just like, we want to see that, like Ileana said, you have a vision and that you've been working towards that vision up until the point that you're coming to us and, you know, making a case for how we would um, help to further it and shape it. Mm -hmm. um, we got a question that says, can our students apply to this? I'm currently a junior at Berkeley, an older student, but emerging artist. Um, I think that we would, if you're a junior, we would have you apply after you graduate. So we are not accepting applications from people who are in a program currently. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, how do you approach applicants who have an artist in residence in the six week program at Highlands previously? Do you remember that policy, Ellie? If not, I can look it up. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I remember speaking about it. At least two, it came up recently. Yeah. I think it's like for, I think for Headlands programs in general, you have to wait, uh, three years in order to reapply. So um, I would use that use that as a, as a framework. And then if you have any specific questions, um, we'll leave our contact information and you can feel free to follow up with us. Um, let's see. Are the mission statements of previous fellowship recipients available for review for context? Oh, um, like their, I see like their application statements. I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think that those materials are necessarily public, but am I interpreting that correctly? Hmm. What we can do is share um, just like information about the artists who were previous recipients. You can find them all on our website, but I'll pop a link into the Q and A. And then someone else asked about, um, oh yeah, let's see. Okay, great. All right. So yeah, I think that what I'll do then is just, I, hopefully this answers your question, AT. Um, we'll just share some of the current artists. Um, I'll pop, I'll pop the links into the chat. And then someone asked about writers, um, and I typed a response, but I will share some of the work that we've only had one writer so far. 
Um, so I will share what they have done as well. I think we got to pretty much everything. Are there last questions before we head out? Oh, I can't see anybody or see anything. Okay, hold on one second, Lee, before you shut it off, though. I just want to share some links about our current Bay Area fellows. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And if you'd like to see this presentation again, and if our YouTube version of it, stream version, isn't um, what you're looking for, we are excited to join Kalan next week on Thursday um, in person, and then down in Palo Alto at um, the Palo Alto Art Center. Um, and I'm forgetting the date off the top of my head it's on our event right. So feel free to share those two dates with your community also, um, or anybody that you'd be excited to um, compete with for the fellowship uh, or not share it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we will be in person in a couple of places and trying to land one um, in SF specifically also. Yeah. So. Um Really, real quick, I just got someone who said that they can't see anything, like any of the responses that I've been posting. Um, hmm. Let's see. So it's in the Q and A, and it's under answered. Where are oh, the links? I think when you answer, you're answering to individuals, uh, one on one. So you'll want to pop mm -hmm. that information into the chat. Okay. All right, let's see. Sorry about that, y'all. Okay, so that's current um, Bay Area Fellows for folks who are interested in the wall space. And for and this is actually a good example um, for a larger artwork as well. Um, I'm going to post this. And then we can send a follow-up email as well if, if we need to with resources. Um, okay. Is there a preference for visual artists versus writers? I don't think there's any preference for discipline. Um, and we can, we can still get really creative with what that means for public programs. So no stress. All right, y'all. Um, I just want to say that Ileana and I are both super open to being reached out to. So we'll both share our emails. Um, and y'all should just reach out if you want to organize a campus visit, if you have any questions um, that weren't answered here, that's what we're here for. Cool. All right, sweet. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. See you all out there soon. Yeah, cool. Bye.